Women's History Initiative of the Historical Society of Palm Beach County. My name is Alexandria Ayala. I am a member of the School Board of Palm Beach County, and in that role, I represent the School Board on the Historical Society's Board of Governors. I'd like to thank our board members here in attendance tonight, John Arthur, Tom Burns, Vernique Williams, and our board chair, Richard Johnson, or who I believe I saw downstairs. If I missed you, it is not by intent. Thank you for joining us tonight. And of course, you'll get to hear from two of our esteemed members of our board, Penny and Mary, later this evening. Our first portrait and leadership panel back in March 2021 looked a lot different than tonight's event, as only the panel and the technicians could be in the room, thanks to a little something we know as the pandemic. Your presence tonight improves the results immeasurably, and so thank you for coming and joining us for this great evening celebrating Women's History Month. All of our panels are recorded and will live indefinitely on the YouTube page of the Historical Society of Palm Beach County's channel. Please spread the word, especially to any young women in your life who I know will benefit greatly from following in the footsteps and learning from the leaders you'll get to hear from this evening. Our moderator will be introduced by Mary Freitas, a fellow member of the Historical Society Board of Governors and a member of the Executive Committee as well. Thank you again. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexandria. Uh, good evening. My name is Mary Freitas, and we'd like you to please make a note of our sponsors and host committee, signage over there, who've made this year's celebration of Women's History Month possible. We're so appreciative for all their support. We're fortunate tonight to have as our moderate, our moderator, Nathalie Pozo, part of the Tri-Anchor Morning Team for West Palm Beach ABC affiliate WPBF 25 News. She was raised in Miami, born to Cuban parents of which she is very proud. She attended Florida International University and the University of Miami, where she earned a degree in broadcast journalism Natalie began her reporting career in Gainesville, Florida before joining WPBF two years ago. For two years, I'm sorry, during the next decade, she worked at news stations in Miami, Atlanta, and Boston, where she received two Emmy Awards for her coverage of the shooting of Red Sox legend David Ortiz and her coverage of a winter storm that impacted the Northeast. After being gone for nearly nine years, she returned home to South Florida and WPBF 25 in the fall of 2022. Nathalie has been married to Eduardo Reyes since 2015, and it's now her turn to take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Thank you, Mary, for that lovely introduction. It's so nice to be with all of you here tonight, and it's an honor to share the stage with these four incredible, distinguished, strong women who are leaders and who have made history here in Palm Beach County. This evening, we are gonna learn more about each one of their journeys, how they got to where they are today, any challenges they may have faced and overcome in that path to where they are today, and advice that they have for women leaders today. It's very hard to keep their bios short because they have accomplished so much in their lives but we are gonna highlight some of their accomplishments. So let's meet our panelists. Nancy Goodman Brinker may be best known as founder of the Susan G. Komen and Susan G. Komen Race for the Cure, named after her sister, Susie. She grew up in Illinois, where she attended the University of Illinois. President George W. Bush appointed Nancy as ambassador to Hungary and chief protocol officer of the US. President Barack Obama awarded her the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest honor that you can receive as a civilian. She has been named one of the 100 most influential people in the world by time and inducted into the Texas and National Women's Hall of Fame. In 2018, Nancy spearheaded the creation of Promise Fund of Florida, a nonprofit formed to improve the outcomes and reduce deaths of breast and cervical cancers. She hosts Conversations with Nancy Brinker weekly on Newsmax. Nancy was the 2018 Archival Evening Honoree for the Historical Society of Palm Beach County, and she is the proud mother of an adult son named Eric. Let's welcome Nancy this evening. Next, we have Penny Greenberg-Murphy. She is the president of Pioneer Linens 
which evolved from her grandfather, Max Greenberg's 1912 Lake Worth business and moved to Clematis Street in 1930. Penny attended Stevens College and George Mason University before earning her master's at Wheelock College at Boston University in Massachusetts. After teaching in Palm Beach County Public Schools, she opened the first private kindergarten in Wellington. When her children were of school age, Penny helped St. Anne Catholic School with marketing and fundraising. Her father, George, invited her to bring her knowledge to Pioneer in 1994, and she took the company virtual. When her father passed in 2007, she was prepared to run Pioneer Linens where she now today enjoys collaborating with her daughters, Marissa and Camille. Penny and her husband, Alan, also have a son, Alan Murphy Jr. Penny has served on the Historical Society of Palm Beach County for many years. Let's welcome Penny. <laughs> Next is Lori Sherman Silvers. She has a long track record of leadership in the corporate, nonprofit and educational arenas. Born in Illinois, she moved to Miami Beach at the age of 12. She received her Bachelor of Science and JD degrees from the University of Miami and practiced law for 10 years. Turning to her passion for business, she co-founded several businesses, including the Sci-Fi Channel, Hollywood.com, and Misfits Gaming, a global esports company. She is a former chair of the Economic Council of Palm Beach County and WPBT Channel 2 and co-chair of South Florida PBS during the merger of WPBT and WXEL. Lori now serves on the National PBS Foundation in Washington, and in 2021, after 15 years on the University of Miami Board of Trustees, she was named chair of the board. Lori's son is State Representative David Silvers. Welcome, Lori. And our fourth panelist is Ethel Isaacs Williams. She is the national president of The Lynx Incorporated, one of the oldest organizations of black women dedicated to service. A native of West Palm Beach, Ethel earned a bachelor's degree from George Washington University and her JD degree from Nova Southeastern University School of Law. In addition to practicing law for her own and other firms, she has held corporate positions such as senior vice president of Kaufman Lynn Construction and Director of Corporate Engagement for Diversity and Inclusion at Next Era Energy. She is the chartering president of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women West Palm Beach Chapter and has served on many local boards and is the past chair of the Quantum Foundation and Boca Raton Chamber of Commerce. Ethel is married to retired attorney and chief of police Clarence D. Williams III and is the proud mother and grandmother. Welcome, Ethel. Again, as you can see, we have incredible, strong women here with us this evening. This is an evening to uplift, empower one another, and have very important conversations. So let's go and get started. Lori, we're going to start with you. Okay. So when, if ever, did you realize there may be limitations on what you could achieve because you were a woman? Mm, never. Never. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> never, yes. <laughs> That's, that's, that's my serious answer. Um, early on, my first, my first mentor was my father. And he always told me that as long as I did my homework and I was the smartest person at the table, there wasn't anything I couldn't do. And that lived inside of me for, a, for till now. So I really never felt that there was an obstacle. Yes, there were a few things I had to overcome, but I always figured it out. So I never thought that being a woman would stop me doing anything I really wanted to do. How incredible, too, to have a, a supportive father at home teaching yes. his daughter independence yes. and that she can do whatever she sets right. her mind to. Right. That's wonderful, Lori. Okay, Nancy, we're going to head over to you. What keeps you grounded with the pressure of your many roles? Well, um, I've learned to try to map out every day and make sure that the most important things in my life I start with first, which are my family and health care and things. And now I'm focused on living as long as I can because it's going to take me a long time to finish the recent organization. <laughs> <laughs> and Lori is one of the co-founders with me, so she knows. But um, really, I think it just takes more organization and the realization that 
we have to fight against ageism. It, it just annoys me that women over 70 are not at, are not, uh, you know, consider good board members, so you can't be appointed to a certain, there's just a still, not too far, but kind of a covered, you know, uh, perception that once you turn a certain age, when in fact, if you work hard and you do things right, you often have more wisdom than, you know, you can add something always. And just never to allow yourself to be defined. I had a father like Lori. My father sat down with me every day, told me he wanted me to be a lawyer first and then a senator in that order. I didn't get either one because I didn't do well in any of those tests because I am dyslexic. Well, you I've did well in many other things, Nancy. <laughs> but I think it's just that I, you know, getting the strength from a parent, and especially in this case a father because they always had the advantages over women. Now I think it's both parents that should do that for their kids. All right, Nancy, thank you. Ethel, this next one is for you. Mm -hmm. Women of color have the challenge of both gender-based and race-based. How have you overcome that double bias? Well, I think the first thing to recognize is that it is still something that we're challenged with. Um, so to say it's overcome would say that it doesn't exist. So it still exists. So what we have to do is, and I say to people of all hue, it's not about being colorblind, but color brave. So that means that you embrace all races, all people. Um, for me, it was the same kind of parenting that was instilled in me. My mother um, taught school here for 38 years. She taught generations of, of students. My father was a Baptist minister. So there were parishioners that worked both as domestics as well as CEOs. So I saw the full gamut of people and their possibilities. So for me, um, the immutable trait of my skin color um, is something that I was born with. I was, um, I feel blessed with my heritage. Um, being female, I also feel blessed um, that I was born female. And I am very happy to say that when you take the whole person, the whole person is who you embrace, and the whole person is who you bring to others. So that's how I have a, uh, approached life each and every day. a question because I feel like you each kind of touched upon this um, before we move on to, to your question Penny but I mean as women I think we're constantly over um, having to deal with obstacles put in the way right you brought up ageism a woman of color um, do you think that we're making progress do you think that we're taking steps in the right direction to help the younger generation for anyone who wants to answer well, that. I'll, I'll jump into that because I think that women uh, women that have achieved success in their life and, and how they, they've gotten to that point, I think they have an obligation to extend a hand and help the younger women that are coming up. It doesn't mean that we've stopped growing and, and being you know, vital and part of the, uh, you know, the scene, if you will. But I do think that women play a huge role in nurturing, supporting, and offering confidence to the younger women. Because women, women truly, shape the world. I'm a little prejudiced. I'm a woman. But uh, I, I, would, I would venture to guess that women, bear, we bear on our shoulders a lot. And I'm not going to go through everything. You all know what we go through. Uh, but I do think that it's important that women have, young women have women to look up to, to aspire to, and you know, hear the words of wisdom. It's important to motivate the younger generation. Did you yeah. want to add something? I, I, I just think that the thing that also um, was important to me in my growing up is that, you know, those things that are part of your gift, that's, that's what you give to the world. So it's that confidence that many are lacking. And where does that come from? Where do you get that confidence? It's going to come from, it's the nurturing part that brings the confidence. And you may not have children, you may not have someone in your neighborhood younger, but there is always one other woman that you can encourage that you can support, and I think it's an obligation of women to support other women, mm -hmm. regardless of what station and stage in life. My mother used to always say, you may attain things in life that put you in a position where you're better off, but you will never be better than another human being. So I think that gives us all a sense of value and worth. So yes, we've come a long way, but you know what? There are times when those isms raise their heads and it feels like we haven't come as far as we'd like to come. And that I know we still have a lot to do. So yes, we've made some progress, but it's still a road ahead. 
Mm -hmm. I love what your mother told you. Oh my goodness. Penny, let's go over to you. As a native of Palm Beach County, how have you seen life change for women here? I think that um, it's so much different than it was when I was growing up. And I really believe that um, I wish that we would have had the mentors like you ladies, because we did not have that. Um, when the way I was taught was it was during the 50s, and it was the women were just told, um, you can get married, look pretty, you get a degree, but your husband, everything will be fine, your husband will take care of you. And, and unfortunately for many of us, um, we, got, we did what we were told, we went to college, we got our MRS degree, <laughs> and then shortly after that, we all came back and got divorced. And so it was really interesting. <laughs> When we went off to school, I went to Forest Hill High School. I did not have a guidance counselor that said, hey, you might want to think about law, or you might want to um, be a, um, an accountant. The, the things that you went off to school for were to be a teacher. That was the main thing that a lot of women of my generation became. And they also um, became um, maybe bank tellers, or not that there's any, I mean, but they weren't the jobs. They did not encourage you to aspire to anything higher. So shortly after that in the 70s, like I said, when my friends got back, we're like, well, what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I went to a dinner one night with two other girls. One of them was a nurse, and she was saying, you know, these doctors are just so pompous, and they're not really patient-oriented. I could do a much better job. So she ended up going to med school. My other friend that was at dinner that night became, an, she was working for social work and she was frustrated with the system. And so she um, said that she was gonna go back and get an accounting degree. And so then I went home that night because I was a teacher with the Palm Beach County school system and you know that could be, there was a lot of bureaucracy going on at that time in the school system. And I thought, well, what am I gonna do? So. I went home and decided that I would go back and get my master's at Wheelock and got a degree and then came home and started that school. So at that time, in, in Florida, they're just, women were just starting to take off. Um, and then once we got back and we were professionals, there was the Kiwanis Club, they weren't accepting women. There was the Rotary Club, they weren't accepting women. So finally, um, toward the end, and um, you'll remember this, they, uh, you know, they, they ended up forming executive women here of the Palm Beaches. Mm -hmm. But it was a lot different. So, and then, Penny, Penny, the same question we had for Lori at the beginning, what limitations did you, I mean, I know you just spoke about that a little bit, but I mean, was there ever a time where you said, I don't know if I can do this, or you know, did you, lose confidence at times saying this is this is just too hard I, I can't continue fighting everyone who says I, I can't do this um, I don't think that I don't think that my um, original upbringing was just to go along with the flow my mom didn't work and um, and she stayed home and most of my friends mothers were the you know were the same way they were the old southern gals mm -hmm. and they they were home and they were taking care of their families but I think through my friends and, and the seeing that they were making changes, I was like, I wasn't going to get left behind, so. <laughs> All right, and Ethel, same question for you as a native of West Palm Beach. How have you seen just, you know, women's roles changed here? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think there are so many firsts, um, and we still have firsts particularly of women of color. Mm -hmm. When I look on the wall and I see Judge Catherine Brunson, when I think of uh, Cherie Davis Cunningham, who now has a bar association mm -hmm. named after her, Eva Mack, that was the first black um, female mayor, uh, my mother, um, because she was um, just a force to be reckoned with. She was not a joiner because she served kind of humanity. Um, she was the teacher that would take the child to see, to meet the need of the child. They needed clothes, they needed shoes, whatever the need was. So for me, I have always seen these role models. The one thing about limitations, um, I don't want you to think I grew up in this bubble, then they didn't speak about racism and they didn't speak about segregation. 
I was born in 1963. My siblings were born um, as early as 1948. So there was a spread in the household almost of a generation and a half. But what they, what they also instilled was that there will be other societal pressures. And you can't change the behavior of people. Laws can't legislate the heart. Laws can only make it a little more impunitive, a little more punitive, uh, and perhaps impede some bad behavior. So those limitations, I was taught early on, you're going to fight through it because there will be limitations, and a lot of it is dictated by people's own ignorance or people's own mindset that you can't fix all of that, but you have to be confident, know who you are, and show up with excellence. That, is, that trumps ignorance every time, excellence. It is the way that people then can see the person. They can say, oh, you know what, we have more in common. You know, you like martini, you like wine, I like wine. You like, you like sweet potato pie, I like sweet potato pie. You get to that commonality when you just peel the onion and start looking at people as people. And soon some of those um, isms and some of the things that they set as limitations really start falling by the wayside. You know, this morning we had a, a story on, on the news and, and we always read our scripts before we, we go on live and um, we read a story about Lake Park naming their first mayor and first female commissioner of color, which is wonderful, but I thought to myself, now? This is the first time this is happening? Now? You know? So yeah. just kind of you know, speaking to what you're saying. Lori, uh, next question is for you. How do you raise a son to respect and encourage female leaders? I'm really tough. And Talk so to us about <laughs> State Representative Silvers. <laughs> so yes, I'm very proud of all of my children. I have one son and two daughters and five grandchildren. Um, and I, it was always important that all of my children understood that we're all, and to, to your point about just we're all uh, people and we need to speak to each other with respect and with understanding and not just assume that so, someone is a certain way because that's how they look, that's how they act, that's how they speak. Uh, and it was, a, it was a lesson that I taught all of my children. And my son grew up knowing that I had very strong values and he could either agree with me or not agree with me and it was okay. But he had to hear me out. We don't agree on everything, <laughs> um, but the important stuff we do. And so, he is legislating for the great state of Florida, and I'm very proud of him because he listens. And he doesn't, he, he listens and he wants to hear what is really important to people, to their lives. And I, one of the things that I made sure that I instilled in them all, you have to assume the best and work towards it. So that's, that was pretty much the, the lessons that I taught him. I happen to think I did a really great job, and he's a, he's, a really, he's a really great guy. But my daughters do understand that, and I have to teach them as well. They're all grown up, and they have children of their own, but I don't stop teaching. So they, they get it from their mama, then, is what she's saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Nancy, same question for you. Well, I have a, you know, I'm, I'm a little older than the generation sitting, most of the people sitting in here, actually. But I did learn something a long time ago particularly when I found out that, my parents found out that I had some kind of reading problem, and it turned out to be sort of normal dyslexia, that you can never just, you can never say no. The greatest thing that ever happened to me is when people would walk up if I was starting something in both cases, both organizations, we don't think this is gonna work, it just won't work. That is such a wonderful thing for me to hear, because I love overstepping the bar. To their surprise, you have to always stick with something and be so committed to it that you're really going to do it. And by really doing it means you've got to sacrifice a lot of the time. And, that, and it becomes sometimes a little hard because your family loses out, other people lose what they want from you sometimes, but you've got to remember, if you're going to really get something done, you've got to stick to it. And you can't take other people's doubt as a prescription of what's going to happen to you in the future or what your dreams are. Nancy, we're going to stay with you. Um, do you remember when you first realized that you were suited for leadership, and did it scare you? No, because I... They're so tough. <laughs> so tough. No. So strong. <laughs> what, what, what I just used to do was sit there and watch people do things, and I'd say, there's a better way to do that, I think. And a lot of it started with the little boys I went to kindergarten with. They were wimpy. 
I hate to say it, but they were, and the girls were always playing, and we were playing then. We started to play sports and things. And I learned that you just can't let other people define you. And it's really important for women to learn how to have courage. And that's the hardest thing, because if you are working at something and you're fortunate enough to have been educated and have the opportunity to work with people that you know in the end may be far smarter than you are, far more successful, is being secure within yourself that you're doing the right thing. And not, you know, you have to learn something. No means maybe. Whenever you're doing something and someone says, that can't be done, maybe it can, and you should be the person to try it. And this is for anyone who wants to <laughs> answer. Where do you find that confidence? Because I feel so many times as women, it's very hard for us to know our worth. You know, we think, oh, if I'm working hard enough, they'll see. They'll see that I'm working hard enough, and I'll get that promotion because they'll recognize my work versus a man marches into that office, you know, and yeah. demands and, 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 and takes charge and does it. So <laughs> why do you think some of us are like that, and where does that confidence come from? Well, I don't know that it's necessarily um, born. Um, you know, there's the question of are leaders um, nurtured or are, is it innate? And I think it's a combination, depending on the person. Uh, I do believe that none of us get to any place that we are by ourselves. I was the youngest of seven. So the baby usually is a little more bossy. So it may have started then, um, you know, wanting to take over or take charge or be heard and seen. But it is, it's important, um, as I talk to um, younger women and women of all ages, because I really like talking to those that are a little more seasoned than me because they have a lot of wisdom to impart. I think that it's, we can't forget the fact that it takes a village. All of us needs that encouragement. So even the toughest, sharpest, most awesome woman, there's a part, there's a little girl inside that's scared to death. Um, some of us who speak all the time, we hate to start the speech. You know, there's nerves that comes from singers. You can talk to, there are certain artists and they say, well, you know, I'm nervous every time I stand up to sing. So I think it just, it's that encouragement. Some of it may have been instilled, but we all need just that little nudge at just the right time to say, you can do it. So that's why it's incumbent upon us. You never know who needs a word of encouragement from you on any given day to say you can make it, you can do this. And Ethel and Nancy, this question is for both of you. How can women make a difference without China. great financial resources? She was about to chime oh, in. Oh, sorry, was, Lori, go ahead. No, 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 sorry that, about that. that that's okay. Um, it, it's to your point, um, and that's to, to your point, it's so important that women become the role models for other women. One of the most I think the biggest compliment I get when I speak afterwards when people come up and they want to speak to you about some of the comments you made, I often hear from other women say, well, if you could do it, I can do it. <laughs> now, what are they really saying? They're, they're really saying, you seem normal. Mm -hmm. You seem like <laughs> one of us. If you can do it, I can do it. And to me, that is the greatest gift. If you, I can inspire somebody, you don't have to be you know, a, a doctorate of, of whatever. Just be yourself and be confident that you can do it and then nobody's gonna stop you. That you confidence to, takes you a long way. You know, and, and I, I really agree with that. And also I agree with no matter what faith you have, and it may not be a faith that other people even recognize, you have to have it somewhere. You have to believe that there are people you can always learn from, um, you can always do something if you feel secure or you can make yourself feel secure. But honestly, um, if you don't take the hard jobs, that's the other thing that I think you were referring to. Always raise your hand to the gals that are younger here and take the hardest job and do the best job at it. And there's just something about that when everyone else didn't think you could do it and you did it and you did it well. There's something about that that you'll never lose, that you'll just be so grateful that you did it and pray the whole time that you don't fail. <laughs> <laughs> and even if you have a few failures, a failures along you. the way, right? We learn right. from that and we grow right. from that and right. it just makes you better the next time you go and, right. and, and try exactly. to achieve something like that or set a goal like that. Um, let's go back to that other question. This is for Ethel and Nancy. Mm -hmm. How can women make a difference without great financial resources? Well, you raise it from other people. You've got to find it somewhere. <laughs> and, that, and that's the hardest thing sometimes to do. I can't stand having to raise money. But on the other hand, you know, even if you're a gazillionaire at some point, I, I would imagine people still feel they need more. I just think that it really represents not so much money, but 
a, a strong uh, value being created, that people will come and play and do and work hard. And when they have to involve, when it involves writing a check or giving something of themselves, it's currency. It's currency that you're spending. And you need to make sure it's well spent and that you keep moving on and gaining more confidence and having the ability to, to also teach that to young women. Don't ever, ever give in to you can't do it. Ethel? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, you know, that's why it takes a village and it takes leveraging our networks. Uh, but I also believe that philanthropists um, understand that true philanthropy stands at the intersection of resources and need. Mm -hmm. So then you take on that, you say, okay, so I'm here, I have resources, which not, is not always money, sometimes it's talent, sometimes it's giving of your time. And what need is being met by you offering time, talent, or resources? So I think, you know, we, we sometimes measure um, it by the amount. Um, you know, they say in, in church, um, not always equal amount, but equal sacrifice. So that's where the, the concept of tithing comes from. So I believe that all of us can give something back. And it's incumbent upon us if there's something broken. You know, the, the difference, one of the differences between the marginalized and what we would sometimes categorize as the privilege is sometimes just choice. Those that are marginalized don't have a lot of choice. They don't have a choice of where they're born. They don't have a choice always of where they're living. They don't have a choice of access to health care and economic means. However, they should have, and hopefully there's a village that says, here's an opportunity for you. No one's asking for a handout, but a hand up, so that there's an opportunity to level the playing field so that we, we can be a contributor to society. And sometimes that's just giving people your knowledge to show them the pathway. Because if no one is telling them, yeah, there's a path uh, pathway, then they feel that all they see is all there is. I love that. Not a hand out, but a hand up. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, that's real great. Can I say? It's true. Yes, yeah. Penny, go ahead. I just want to say that I think we are so lucky to live in the community that we live in. Everyone is so incredibly generous here. We have. Um, we're sitting in the Historical Society Museum today because uh, Pat and Richard Johnson were kind enough to right. give that money right. to, um, so that we could redo this building and, um, and be able to archive all of the thing, all the history that we have from West Palm Beach. We also have the Norton, we have the Kravitz Center. And we also have a lot of nonprofits here that people support and are so generous about. And I want to say that the three ladies that I'm sitting with are just so phenomenal and so generous. And, and again, that's why we are so lucky to live in Palm Beach County. Well, I think you need to count yourself. And you too. <laughs> Honey, we're going to stay with you. How can a mother um, instill leadership? In, in her daughter? Well, I'm really lucky. I've got two daughters that are working with me, and I've got my daughter-in-law here this evening, and I've got two little granddaughters that are coming up, and a grandson as well, so I'm really blessed that way. But I think that the most important thing is that action speaks louder than words, and so I think that you have to make sure that you are a good role model for your daughter. Um, I think you have to make them feel comfortable so that they don't mind trying new things. And I think that also, um, I'll tell you a funny little story. So when my kids were little, they used to go out with my father, who was a well-known character in Palm Beach County. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, his name is George Greenberg. Some of you may know who he is. But anyway, they would go out with him. And I would say to them, okay, now when Papa introduces you to people, make sure that you stick your hand out, you look at them, and you say, it's nice to meet you. And if you do that, I'll give you a quarter. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so they did. And, um, and I think that that was really good for the kids. I think that that um, gave them the confidence because when they, they had good manners, they were complimented on those manners. And so they felt good about being able to do that they were put into different situations, and I think the younger that they start doing that, the more confidence that they get. And, and you're so right. Civility counts for so much. You know, our, 
the one air thing that we haven't discussed is the size of the community we're living in and its massive explosion in population, in wealth, and other things that go along with it, some not so good. The other day I was walking down the main the shopping street, Worth Avenue, and I saw a man with New York license plate <laughs> sitting in front of me and with his top down screaming his head off at the people in front of me. I just stood there for now. What can I say to him? And then he screamed some more. And this went on for about 10 minutes until the shopkeepers came out of the stores and they were just screaming. And I just walked up to him and said, sir, you know what? You're going to be a lot happier if you go back to New York. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, well, he said four letter words. But he looked at me oh, and I said, boy. well, see, that's what I mean. You're going to be happier. You can say those things in New York. But that's not how we talk to each other here. We try to be civil. And, and it'll work if you try it. And I walked <laughs> off, and the shopkeepers came up to me and said, thank you, thank you. For but it, it, is, it is recognizing other people, being kind, thanking people often over and over and over again, and inspiring them. You know, so we, we live in that kind of community. Kindness really does get you a long it does. way, doesn't it? It, it does. It does. <laughs> ahead, so, so you mentioned um, that I am the chair of the University of Miami, which is a, a wonderful experience and it's a wonderful institution and thank you I know well you're obviously one of our a successful fellow hurricane yes. <laughs> yes. oh we've got some basketball going on yes we do yes we do <laughs> um, but so I interact with a lot of the young people on campus I walk around campus I have lunch with the students I want them to see that the chair of the board is a woman and I'm double alum I went got my undergraduate and my law degree there you know one of the things that it's kind of a theme that we've been talking about kindness and confidence, it's really hard for young people today because of the environment that we live in with all the things that are social, social media, the, the, the ability to bully, you know, in a, in a very um, unseemly way. To be able to share with young people the fact that women are strong, women survive, women get through things. It, 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 I can't reach every single student at the university, but if I can reach one, it's very meaningful. And I think that there's a common theme here, being kind, showing kindness, being confident, just the way you carry yourself. It speaks volumes, and today, more than ever, women need to be that way. Mm -hmm. Each other. So important, like we said earlier, to uplift and, and yes. encourage one another. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Nancy, He's soft, but oh. carry a big stick. <laughs> right. <laughs> Nancy, you can't do that. You've got to be careful. That's <laughs> your <laughs> <National> treasure. <laughs> Nancy, I want to uh, talk a little bit about your serious illness and how you overcame it um, and, and how that just changes, changed your outlook on life. Well, I think any time that happens to you, it's a great shock. I lost my sister to breast cancer when she was only 36. I developed the disease a few years after she died. And I, maybe one of the most interesting things to me besides trying to get through all the fear and knowing that my lifespan may be short and very, I don't know when, but it, it could be, um, is that at, at Susan G. Coleman at the time, we were funding a lot of the work, uh, research on genes, on genes, mutation of genes and the uh, effect it has on cancer or to create your cancer in your body. And also, to, you're surprised because you can wake up, nothing hurts, and you find out you have a really deadly mm -hmm. disease. It took me quite a long time to live with that. And luckily, I had another four years after that. Um, but I have had reoccurrences of it because I have a genetic mutation that oftentimes Jew Jewish women do called BRCA positive breast cancer. And uh, that's what my sister had. That's what my father had. And um, you just learn to live with it. You've got to. You can't give up. And you have to be very careful, and you have to learn what you can do and not let it overtake you. You've got to overtake it somehow. You've got to pray every day that you can and go forward. You it. can't let it define you. You can't let it define you. You've got to be positive. You've got, and, and achieving things helps you get over it because you feel whatever it is, you can still do things. You can still do this. You can do that. And anyway, that's sort of the method I've, I've used. And I had great support from my family. Um, so I have a wonderful son. He's very supportive of me. And you know, you just get through it. 
I think this is a great opportunity to bring up the Promise Fund. Nancy was telling me a little <laughs> bit about it right before we got up here and just all the amazing work the organization is doing for women here in our community. Let everyone know a little bit more about it. Well, Lori was one of our co-founders and um, it, what we decided is that we found out, and I found out sort of by happenstance, that there are about 100,000 women in our county, third largest county and the third largest state, who have no primary care no insurance, no one to give them a medical home. And it, to me, it looked like a disaster waiting to happen because you can't do that in a community and have civil, civil behavior go on forever. So we just started really looking at the landscape and, and the organization or the institution we could work through to deliver people good care. Well, that turned out to be an organization that maybe many of you have heard or seen found care which is a federally qualified health care system. I know this sounds boring. Most people in America don't even know we have this system. But every single president has supported it. There has not been a Congress or a Senate who has ever voted against it. Because why? It's, it's actually Obamacare, where every patient is seen when they come in. They have to pay something. It could be $5 in their pocket. It could be uh, $10. It could be nothing, because people will be treated for that. But good primary care generally always assures people, including myself, that if you have a good primary care physician, have a good exam every year, you will find something that either needs to be attended or treated. And we started thinking about it. I thought, this is a place where we need to move in more primary care. And we got a, a mammography installation donated by great friends of mine in a country called, a company called Hologic to found care. And then we brought on patient navigators these are people who are somewhere between full nurses and social workers. And they care about the patients mm -hmm. they're dealing with. They're community navigators. And we have hired them with a solid bond of understanding that they will do everything they can to navigate women with the right care. And so far, uh, because we have been very successful with the people we've hired and brought on and the ethic they have, we've impacted either educated, screened, uh, treated or, or sent through what we call continuum of care to aggregate services of care because we are in a for-profit healthcare environment here, which means it's darn hard to get just for people who are insured, let alone those who aren't. But what we've done now is managed to impact over 22,000 of the 100,000 women. And next year, I've challenged the group to double that and double the next year so that by the beginning of first quarter 2025, we will have gone through a significant round of population and by the way, it's not just the women who are neglected in this case, it is men too. Mm -hmm. So um, hopefully the system will continue to work. We're very proud of it. We're proud of the people we get to work with. And I just thank God every day that I have such colleagues who, who would stick with it. And now we have a really great organization. You know, Lori and Nancy, I, I think about all the women who um, you, you've helped possibly save their lives in, in providing them with this preventative care, mm -hmm. you know, catching exactly. something early, but, That's right? right. Yeah. The care, the care, even with a disastrous disease, when it's caught early, you have a 90% mm -hmm. chance of outliving it or, you know, having periodically checkups and getting to the next stage. But it's a time for us to be really take advantage of being one of the great places people want to live, which is Florida and one of the great counties that they want to live in. We have so much here, and why shouldn't people in our county be healthy, happy, have jobs, civility, have great families? Why shouldn't they? It's beautiful. It's, it's I mean, so many resources here. And, um, <clears throat> and, and a beautiful place to live. To we need, need more, more volunteers. volunteers. <laughs> we need more volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> you are already volunteering. The are you? <laughs> more volunteers. I just want to put that out there. <laughs> Lori, we want to go back to um, your law school days and how that not only prepared you, you know, in, um, in, your, in your career of law, but also outside of that as well. I love law school. So let's just get this straight. I'm a nerd, and I love <laughs> the reading and all the discipline that went along with law school. Uh, I, I, I love the fact that I had to focus in on issues and I had to have real clarity when I was, and, and you're a lawyer also, so you have to have real clarity in understanding what goes into a lawsuit, the appellate program, Supreme Court, it's very complicated, um, especially for a first year student. If you make it through that first year, you're pretty, pretty assured to get it through all the way. 
but it allowed me to think strategically. So I practiced law for a number of years. I decided that that really wasn't my passion and that I wanted to be in business. And so I found that my passion was being an entrepreneur. And all the things that I've done, creating the Sci-Fi Channel, um, creating you know, Hollywood.com, MovieTickets.com, the first company to ever have electronic movie tickets from you know, the, the box office to your home, and now a global esports organization. It, it's, it's to me, if I see an idea that doesn't exist, to me, that's what gets me up in the morning, to, to be able to put my fingerprints on something and change the landscape. Yeah, and I learned the skills in law school. It taught me how to think strategically and focused. And so I am forever grateful. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing at the University of Miami. I am forever grateful for that level of education and, and, and how it, it changed me. Lori, for any woman watching or, or here in the audience who says, you know, I, I have an idea, but I'm so scared about taking that risk. I'm so scared about making that move. What, what would you say to them? Mm. Well, <laughs> so I'm an entrepreneur, which if you look it up in the dictionary, the first word that comes up is risk taker. Okay. It's actually, actually a combination yeah. word, right? Uh, so you can't be afraid of risk and you can't be afraid of failure because failure is the biggest obstacle mm -hmm. that will stop you from achieving your goals, whatever they are. And so when you realize that failure is only a, a part of your path with success and that you should not, be, not allow yourself to be stopped by it, uh, you, can, you can achieve great things. Yes, there's fear because you have to, generally you have to put money towards ideas. Mm -hmm. And what if somebody else, my greatest fear when I was doing the Sci-Fi Channel, a hundred years ago was, this is such a great idea. How come nobody else has thought about it? And, and, and that was really a, a big fear for me. Well, nobody else thought about it because the others out there were the, you know, the Walt Disney Company, uh, Warner, Paramount, the big players. And when you're in a big organization, it's very difficult to do something that costs a lot of money and has a tremendous amount of risk. It's very intimidating. Mm -hmm. It's very intimidating. And if you fail there, you're probably going to lose your job. <laughs> but as an entrepreneur, that's what you do. You come up with ideas, you take big risks, and you don't lose your job. You, and that's why this country is built on great entrepreneurship. People that are willing to take the risk, willing to do something different. And so I'm very proud to be an entrepreneur, and that's the answer. Mm -hmm. Ethel, and same for you. How yes. did law school prepare you for, for things outside of law? Sure. Well, I went to law school late, meaning I didn't go straight from undergrad to law school. I worked, my first job was IBM in Texas. That's a whole other story um, about being a first. Um, if we have time, I'll tell you that one because <laughs> yeah, barriers were everywhere. Um, but I went from IBM in Dallas to um, IBM in Connecticut and then Wang Laboratories. Then I said, okay, I'm gonna go back to my original plan, which was law school all along. Um, and my mother was definitely anxious for me to get to law school. My father passed when I was in college, so he didn't get to see that. Um, and so I was older. Um, I was 30 when I started law school. Um, so it was out of my pocket. And I was very intentional, I was very deliberate, and I was very focused. So I literally applied to one law school. What's the closest law school to my mother? My mother was aging at the time and I wanted to be here in South Florida. I applied to her. She says, you've never done just one. You've got to apply to several. And I said, well, not this time. I'm going to actually go here because it's closer. So law school taught me to think critically as well as strategically. It also taught me balance. It taught me how to compartmentalize um, because I was working and I was in law school. And so I had to compartmentalize studies from work to family obligations. And I needed to excel in all of them, or at least I thought I was excelling in all of them. But the other thing it gave me was transferable skills. I didn't recognize it initially, but remember I told you it was something I got back to. My original thought um, when I was at John L. Edward High School, I said, I'm going to be a corporate lawyer. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't have any role <laughs> models. It just sounded good. I watched Perry Mason, I said, I don't want to be in court all day, but I do want to have a little suitcase, you know, a little briefcase, and I want to, you know, dress the part. I think I'm going to be a corporate lawyer. So I had to later find out what corporate lawyer meant. 
And of course, those of you who work in corporations, you know the law department is the last place you want your idea or your project to go because sometimes it's the place where it dreams die or they're delayed uh, because the lawyers are going to make sure everything is in place. So I got back to the business side of things. Um, I cut my teeth in a um, law firm here where I learned real estate and I learned land use and zoning and I met some incredible people. So for me, law school showed me, okay, you are now building your toolkit because this is a skill that you'll always have and no matter what setting you're in, you're always, you can never divorce yourself from what you know and so you always have those legal skills that bring to bear it, be it corporate boards, be it um, in a corporate position, be it in my nonprofits and in, in all of the organizations that I've been involved in. So I, I say that to say to anyone, I'm a lifelong learner, and I say to those who may have um, been in a career for a long time, you say, you know, I really wish I'd gotten my MBA. I really wish I'd gone to law school. Pearl Bailey, now I'm really dating myself. Pearl Bailey, who was a singer actress, she went back to law, went to undergraduate, graduated, I believe, in her 70s from Georgetown. So it is never too late mm -hmm. to get um, whatever degree or whatever you want to pursue in life. So speaking, Nancy said she wants to see more people in the 70s. Well, well, she was ahead of the game, Nancy. <laughs> Pearl Bailey was in school with um, those that were, you know, three, four times mm -hmm. uh, younger than she was. So that's what law school did for me. It provided me lifelong skills and transferable skills that I use in everything that I do. Yeah, and that it's never too late to right. take a shift in that, right. in that path, in that right. journey, right? And I keep going full circle. Law, <laughs> business, law, business. I'm ready to say retired. <laughs> no way. Penny, how could you say that the history of Palm Beach County has played a role in your work? Well, I think that um, it's, my father kept a lot of um, our, he kept a lot of our ads starting with the 1920s. And so, um, it's really interesting to look at some of these ads and it, it portrays all the different decades of things that happened. We have the first colored ad that was in the Palm Beach Post. Um, we have ads from when um, the people were at war in the 40s and there's this, and everything was hand drawn at that time because of course there were no computers and he had an mm -hmm. artist who was on staff. And so um, this one that I'm referring to had a soldier standing outside of a house and it said, get ready, he's coming home soon. Which I thought was, you know, really nice. Um, and so, and I think the history that we have um, kind of lends an authenticity to the business because we, I'm proud to say, are 111 years this year. Mm -hmm. So that's good. But as far, and my dad was very instrumental in helping get the historical society together and, and worked with the Johnsons. Um, he grew up here. He was born in 1915 in Lake Worth and, um, and just, you know, loved being here, loved telling stories of what it was like back in the day. He talked about how he would help my grandfather and he would get on his bicycle and go across some kind of a wooden bridge to go deliver whatever. <laughs> and at that time we weren't a linen store. We actually were a hardware store that evolved into linens, you know, who knew? But, um, so, yeah, a I reminder of the, the progress that we have made, but the yeah. work that still needs to be done. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. if I could chime in on, on the history, I, I really appreciate that question because for me, having grown up here, actually the only sibling that was born here, so my older siblings were born in New York, Tallahassee, so I'm the West Palm Beach native. <laughs> and so I was able to see the progression of, um, the society um, that we live in. I saw the integration. My father was part of a biracial committee that integrated um, the Woolworth counter. Um, he, had a, he had a shop on Clematis. As a matter of fact, Rosemary um, is near and dear because Rosemary was kind of the, the black entertainment street. There was a theater there. There, were, um, there was commercial. There was um, commercial real estate. There were lawyers and doctors and dentists. So it is, it's turned into a, a little different um, paradigm shift has occurred there. The commercialization has you know, evolved over time, but it is still something that I like to take my nieces and nephews and grands through to say, this is where we had entertainment. 
Um, we couldn't go to certain places at that time. So I think when we talk history, you got to tell the whole history because it's all, it's all important to who we are and how we got to where we are. The sticks in the Palm Beaches where is where was a black community in Palm Beach, S-T-Y-X. And the sticks is where my father's, um, he lived here as a boy for a little while, so his grandfather, um, they would visit. And our church, which is still in, the, in um, Pleasant City, mm -hmm. came out of the sticks. So it's such rich history that we cannot afford to forfeit one piece of it because it's all beautiful and it's all part of who we have. Now, it may not have been beautiful and fun at the time for everybody, but it is still part of a beautiful tapestry that says this is where we've been and this is where we are. Ethel, for, for women that are here watching, what advice did you receive that you would like to, to share with other women? Advice. To thine own self be true. Um, my mother would always say to me, um, no one, and there's a whole poem around that, you know, no one knows you but you, um, no one sees the you but you. So authenticity um, is really important. The other thing I would tell women, and I heard Nancy mention it, um, she said, no matter what your faith is, you need to have that. You need to have that anchor. I do believe that young women, sometimes we see so many other images, so many other things put in front of us um, that make up the total woman. But for me, I would advise anyone if they don't already have um, some faith or spiritual anchor, it's important to me to rounds out the woman. It's what gives me inner peace to compartmentalize all these pieces um, and to shut out sometimes the places and spaces that don't always celebrate my voice, but they tolerate the voice. So you got to make sure that you're anchored and you know who you are and whose you are. I apologize. I know we went over, but I am just so moved and inspired by everything they said up here. Wow, let's give them all a round of applause. Okay.